Welcome to Indiana Sports Beat Radio, presented by Andy Morhonda of Bloomington. Know your role and shut your mouth, you jabroni! Fires upfield into the end zone, and it's caught! Jelani Woods! Touchdown! I-N-D-Y! A 43-point night for Tyrese Halliburton! I didn't like that button! Galloway drives all the way to the hole, throws it up, got it! Indiana's got their first lead of this contest. It's pretty simple, I win. Google me. Now, here's your host, Jim Coyle. Hey, hey, everybody, welcome to another edition of Indiana Sports Speed Radio. As it uh, Christmas time continues, Jim Coyle with you. Of course, Indiana Sports Speed Radio, powered by Andy Moore Honda. Then just go to andymorehonda.com to get more to your door. And, of course, free think. Free think apparel and promos. You go to spot for professionally printed sportswear, team apparel, fan gear, signs, promotional products, and more. Whether you need two dozen t-shirts for your upcoming family reunion or 200 for this season's recreational softball league, free think apparel meets your printing needs. Their team of industry experts will work with you to design a professional looking sales generating web store. Just go to freethinkapparel.com today. Get it on. Get it going. How's everybody doing? Man, oh man, Christmas. Christmas come early. Some uh, great games yesterday. Great upsets. Um, great comebacks. You, you had a lot in yesterday. And most importantly, uh, I wish I had, John, I wish, you know how the magicians have that little poof of, they act that, that pops up like there's fire in their hand. It was poof. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. I need one of those. You know why? How come? Now it's, this is my bracket already. Poof. Into thin air. Gone. Gone. That's the way it goes. I, I, I watched it just, I, I'm like, I'm out. I mean, I, I, I'm, as a matter of fact, I'm going to send a text here a little, or tweet in a little bit that just says, with the five, I have, I'll have to find a George Costanza. Uh, this is GIF, GIF. I've Jif. always said GIF, but there's people who will say otherwise. I, now, I used to know the right one. Now I've, I've forgotten, but I need to find that one where there's a scene where George Costanza says, I'm out. When he just, uh, he would say one thing right, and they, they said, George, that's when you got to walk away. Well, I didn't walk away soon enough. My, uh, whoo, yeah, but it was fun watching. Um, of course, first of all, I know everybody would like to talk about the Kentucky loss because they love, uh, to talk about that. And I'm not going to say, all right, I'm not going to lie that I didn't enjoy that one myself. Yeah, I did. Yeah, I mean, I it was. It's always been a joy for, for me to see Kentucky lose, and this is not an upset that I was really confident at all that would happen. I had Kentucky in my Final Four, as I believe you did. Why, hell them. no, hell, man, any, I, yeah. But here's the thing, though. Like, I mean, picking that, picking though, that upset was was either a stroke of luck or just a stroke of mad genius. But when we look in in retrospect, I mean. John Calipari hasn't done anything in the postseason for Kentucky since pre-COVID. I believe Here's 2017, a, maybe. I'm glad you said that. Here's a stat for you that I uh, realized last night. Since 2021, which only three years, but since 2021, Louisville, Kentucky, and Purdue have as many NCAA wins combined as Indiana. I mean, the, I, I 100% believe that. It was an NCAA a whopping wins two. or postseason wins. It's so at a whopping two wins each, though. Too. Okay. Because Louisville has zero. They haven't been in the tournament since right. before, uh, Kentucky before COVID. Kentucky has one. Kentucky beat Providence last year and then lost to Kansas State in the round of 32. And then Purdue, I guess their only win was since 2021. Now this is since yes, 2021. Since 2021. Who, this does who, not who go back there? to their. 
Who was their wins in 20? I guess they went their Sweet 16 run where they lost no, to St. Was, Peter's. Was that a Sweet 16 run? It would have had to be because they, you said it was two wins for each team. And they haven't, they obviously last year lost to Fairly Dickinson. They didn't win a game. Yeah. But anyway, just to make Indiana fans feel better. So, but how odd is that? But that doesn't show that, that does not mean that Indiana's doing well. It means that they all suck. Yeah. All I mean, of them. It's, it's, they been all since, suck. I don't Let's remember be honest what about it. it was. We haven't had a, a tournament. I don't even know why I said it like that. I usually say tournament. We haven't had a tournament with hey, all say three. It. That's, that's how the East Coasters say it, man. Tournament. Oh, yeah. A tournament. We, we haven't had a tournament that featured all three. And this is mainly just because of where I live. I'm using this analogy, I guess. We haven't had a tournament with Indiana, Kentucky, and Louisville all in the same time. Since I don't remember what year. I guess that might have been 2017 as well or 2016. Well, you know, I, I guess I could uh, re rephrase that and say Louisville, Kentucky, Indiana, and Purdue have a grand total of four NCAA wins in the last three years. That ain't good. Yeah, that's, that ain't it, good. But for good. all the Indiana fans that think that uh, Indiana is the most negative and the most – their fans are the this and the that and their fans are – you know, running players off. I wish I could say it. Bull bleep. Oh, it is. And let me tell you, I, I haven't even gone. I, I, I've never gone to other boards, you know, forums to of other teams. And, and I, I meant to last night for Kentucky just because I knew it was going to be. Oh, I listened red to the, the post game show for fire. The, it was well. It was, tell me a little bit how time. how did that. How did that go? Give give me some highlights from the Kentucky post game show. I'll I'll give the so I didn't listen to the entire thing, but I listened enough just to kind of hear Matt Jones's thoughts because I wanted to hear what he had to say. And I tell you, I will say I'll give a compliment to him as as unbearable as he can be, especially to opposing fan bases. He does a good job at being very level headed whenever he's talking about a difficult situation. So I mean the the gist of of his of what his points were last night was that Kentucky can obviously, they can't really buy out Calipari and they shouldn't humor that because if they were to do that, it'd be $34 million, first of all, which that is insane to think about. But, and, and the other part is, is keeping Calipari's legacy alive. If you're a Kentucky fan, because they think about the glory days back at the beginning of his tenure, whenever he was, even if he wasn't always winning a title, they were always close to winning a title. They were always in the conversation. They were always in the final four, that kind of stuff. But since, since 2019, 15, no, since 2015. Well, I'm not talking about this. I mean, yeah, that was the last time they had an amazing team, but that's, but that's, but you, that's what you have to go back to because they haven't done Jack since that's true, which that was the year that they nearly went undefeated 40 and zero. since then they haven't put together a run that you know pleases fans the way that that they they aim to well, do well they so haven't had a run ultimately <laughs> what 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 matt was trying to say was that calipari and kentucky need to come to an agreement where they can just mutually separate and it not be ridiculous for the university to buy him out because obviously the fans are fed up and i mean and fans are fans fans are going to do what they do like we see the indiana perspective of it around here all the time so it's not always sunshine and rainbows elsewhere. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I think, I think that's not, I agree. Doesn't that, I think, that sounds eerily familiar, John, to me. It, oh yeah. I don't, it really I don't, does. I'm like, where, where have I heard that before? <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm trying, it's just, it's not quite coming to me, but I, that just sounds so familiar. Yeah. Um, so it, yeah, it's believe me. The na the wailing and gnashing of teeth is all th throughout the Commonwealth of Kentucky. They they're done. They're they're they're. I they're think last night was proof that the era of one and done basketball being a successful formula is over. Yeah, was wasn't it yesterday or the day before? That I read off when I was reading was yesterday. The, we were talking about the, the seven picks that they've got. Seven, seven, 
Seven NBA draft picks in the top 25 of college players in America. Seven. And who did they get who performed by? well last night for them? It was yeah, the, their oh, seniors. I thought you meant for... No, the, their seniors last night were the guys who, who did well for Kentucky. Antonio and... Reeves had 27 points. Uh, Trey White had, I don't remember what his total was, but he also had a good performance. But their freshmen struggled. They were They played tight. And that's the issue when you get into the NCAA tournament. When you have a team full of young guys, that's if the emotion of playing in the NCAA tournament for the first time is something that, first of all, I've never experienced, but I can almost guarantee that it's not easy to get over that initial hump of what I just said. I just, I can't believe I just said the the Mike Woodson term over the hump. It's not easy to get over those initial (laughs) butterflies and nerves to perform the way that you need to in, in games like that. So, but yeah, Big Blue Nation is is fired up. They're crumbling right now after their loss to the Oakland Golden Grizzlies and a wonderful matchup from or a performance from a sixth man, a guy who came off the bench, went 10 for 20 from behind the arc, shot 50%, set an NCAA off, tournament record. No, he didn't. He tied. He- yeah, he did. Yes, he did. Record for what? For most threes in a in a, in a single game. Nope. He's they were t- the, the, he's the, tied was record. He set some sort of record, did he not? He, he's he is one of only five in players to uh, to ever hit ten or more three point shots in a NCAA tournament game. Four of them are all tied at ten, and there's someone that has eleven. Okay, but. But Maybe he's still only he's still one of only five players to ever hit the 10 or more mark. Um and that player was Jack but, Golke, by the way. We hadn't said his name, but Jack oh, Golke yeah. off well, the bench I sent out the a, Grizzlies. I did send out a uh, a tweet that said uh, the, the new verb for the NCAA tournament is you got Golkied. <laughs> and if you did not see that game. Just go watch the highlights of him knocking those three pointers down because half the time he looks like he's shooting sideways. His body is just, he's like the top half of his body knows I've got to stay here, but the bottom half of his body is still going. I mean, he was hitting unbelievable shots and just draining them. But the biggest one was the the, the corner three that came at the end. Man, you have got to give it to this Oakland team, yeah. they did not wilt, did not wilt. And uh, who will they go on to play here in a couple of days, by the way? Oakland will move oh. on to face NC State, who's also going on a magical run. Yes, and I think that they can win that. Uh, just They have that attitude in their the post game, how they are acting, treating it. The last thing that Goki said is, we're not a Cinderella. It's so funny. Teams that you would never even give two seconds to. This kid, do you know where he came from? He's a transfer. You know where? Division division two. I thought it was division Division. three. Maybe it was division two. But still, he's a division two transfer. Two years ago, it was Doug Eddert with St. Peter's. This year, it's Jack Gulkey with (laughs) Oakland. Yeah, crazy. But quickly, his... uh, 32 points, 32 points for the madman. He, he had zero assists, baby. He That ball got in his hands. It wasn't going to another player. It was headed to the rim. He put up 20 total field goals attempts. Do you know how many of those were two-point attempts? Zero. Bango. As a matter of fact, I think... I think I understood it to say uh, that he only had like four two-point attempts coming into the game. That's that the is beauty of the NCAA tournament. And I know because, before it's always funny, before the tournament ever happens, we always talk about the cliches because they do they are honestly kind of cliches before these games get underway, but then it all happens again, like clockwork every single year, and we pretend we're surprised about it. He goes 10 of 20 from behind the three-point line. Bingo. I mean, that is that is 
Only something you can do in the watch. NCAA tournament, I feel like. What a and this was not the only game to watch. Um Steve Alford's Nevada squad, who was oh, they, 24 they... and 0, 24 and 0 when leading at halftime. They had a lead of uh, I forget uh 15. Uh, something like 15 with seven minutes to go. Was that right? It, they they choked down the stretch. I didn't have – I wasn't watching that one as intently as I was some of the others because I was I was on the middle of doing another radio show whenever that was going on. But, um, yeah, Nevada, they unfortunately let that one slip. That was one of my first major slip-ups of my bracket was Nevada losing to Dayton. And I, I'd been gassing up Steve Alford all day. So I, I, I was confident he would take care of the Flyers. But unfortunately, that's not the case. Uh, Pete, yeah, Pete well, tells us a 17-point lead with seven minutes to go. That's why. Now, how in the hell? How do you lose a 17-point lead with seven minutes to go? Now, this is not the first time Dayton's done that, by the way. They've done it a couple of other times. And... Let me tell you, every time I hear somebody say, get Steve Alford for Indiana's coach, I'm like, <laughs> okay, you're out. You you have you're you you're done. You're not allowed to even make any suggestions anymore. You just lost your your card because that tells me you don't know anything about his coaching. He's been a head coach, division one, for nearly three decades. This is his 29th season. I just Looked it up because I knew, but I wanted to confirm. Do you know what his overall NCAA tournament record is? I don't. I know he's never made it past the Sweet 16, but I don't know what his record is. Not only has he never made it past the Sweet 16, he only has four Sweet 16 appearances in total in that 29-year span. Three of those came during his tenure at uh, UCLA, right before Nevada. Before that, it was one Sweet 16 appearance in like 20 three years or something, which means once every seven years, you make it to the second weekend. Right. He's 12 and 12 overall. That's, that's why, that's why people we've got lots more to talk about more upsets. Uh, who else? Duquesne Duquesne's party rolls on as well. Casey Bartley from at boiler upload. You're going to join us next Purdue on the clock today. This evening as they uh, get underway in uh, their opening game as well. Plenty more to get to. Bob Kravitz on the program and Zach Osterman as well. We're back with all of that and more. Brought to you by Freethink. Let's go to freethinkapparel.com for all your printing needs, shirts. I mean, every they can wrap your vehicle, anything you need, man. Support those who support your favorites. Back with more. Right after this. We'll be right back for more Indiana Sports Beat Radio with Jim Coyle, presented by Andy Morhonda of Bloomington. In the mar- morning, Casey. Good morning, gentlemen. How are we? Oh, fucking McNeese. Oh, I can't say that, can I? <laughs> you can say it on YouTube, but not on the radio. <laughs> fucking McNeese State. Oh, yeah. yeah. God damn. You had them as your that- upsetties? McNeese State in Kentucky just buried my bracket on the first day. I'll say I don't care that I, I love when Kentucky ruins my bracket. Well, that makes me uh, happy. I'm gonna say shame uh, on you I, for uh, believing in a 150th ranked defense. Kentucky, you have a horrible defense. It's horrendous. <laughs> well, I thought they they could get by a, a Division two transfer guard who just that lit play him. that comes off the bench, nonetheless. Oh. I'll be right was, back. How does that happen? What in what movie does that happen? Back in tw- 2024, off the bench, his team waddling, not very well against the mighty Kentucky Wildcats. And here comes wait, did he come off the bench? John keeps saying that. I, I can't imagine that, but I don't have the uh I, I can't tell if he's a starter or not by the stats I'm looking at. <laughs> but I, I I mean, I don't think the way they're showing these stats that he was, but the amount of three-point shots he takes. 
Well, he he played thirty six minutes, so no, yeah, he doesn't off. have. A, he hasn't started. He doesn't start. He plays okay, you know? but he doesn't play for the first four minutes of the game. <laughs> Yeah. So his last one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven games he's played thirty or more minutes off the bench. But yeah, it, uh, Ken that sounds like a, give him a start. That sounds like something Indiana would do, except for this works. Right. Could be that you're trying to get him not against the starters defensively to start, maybe. I don't know. Uh, He's taking 353 pointers this year. Well, let me, I was talking about it earlier. It, man, his body was, he was just, that's well, because he was having to work so hard for his shots. But when he would get a shot, he would go up and it's like the bottom of his body kept going, but he was getting the shot mm-hmm. off. And a little Ryan Kleinish. Yeah, it was crazy. Uh, well, he tie, he's in a uh, one of only five now guys to hit 10 or more in a tournament uh what's his name's Jaden Ivy I think is in that Carson Carson Carson, I, Carson Edwards or there yeah Carson yeah. all right here we go guys out of Tomahawk Steak or a grouper fillet and enjoy it cooked to perfection in Chop Shop Steakhouse Chop Shop Market and Table a part of the Wild Food Group is your butcher baker and fish house no matter where you live this segment is brought to you by the Chop Shop home of the Indiana Football and Men's Basketball Coaches Shows. Welcome back to Indiana Sports Beat Radio with Jim Coyle, presented by Andy Moore Honda of Bloomington. Hey, hey, welcome back. Indiana Sports Beat Radio on this Friday of early Christmas, the NCAA Tournament. Round two will happen today. After a a pretty fun one yesterday, Casey Bartley from Boiler Upload joins me. Man, it, uh, it there wasn't a ton of upsets, but there were enough. The, the ones that there were were pretty stunning, and uh, there was so much drama with Nevada coughing up a 17-point lead with seven minutes to go. I, I'm not – John, you won't – uh, you wouldn't like this, but uh, I, I saw that happen one time. I was at a Louisville, I think it was the Louisville Marquette game, but this has been six years ago. Oh, I know, I know what you're talking about. Yes, that's <laughs> yeah, exactly what you're talking about. Louisville trailed by like 18 points with maybe less than seven, it might have been six minutes. It was crazy, and I've never seen anything like that a barrage of three pointers that went down like that, but that's so wild. Cause that's, you just, you don't see that very often, uh, especially in the NCAA tournament, Steve Alford, uh, Nevada was 24 and Oh, when leading at the half, that didn't work out. Um, UK fans are looking for $30 million. Whew. That's Whew. not, uh, that is not, um, uh, Calipari's not going anywhere. He he'll leave on his terms, but he will leave soon. First of all, I have I haven't said it recently, but when the Kentucky Indiana series restarts, which is uh 2025, Casey, they Indiana had to negotiate it just to get the series back because Kentucky wouldn't play. Mm-hmm. Um there's one game in Indianapolis, I think two in Rupp and one, and the last game is at Assembly Hall. And I've always said that, all right, so that doesn't even start until 25, then it's 26, 27. It's 2028 when the game will be in Bloomington. And there's no way that that um, Calipari was going to be there by then. But, so that only leaves three years in between. I don't think he makes the three years, but I will give him this. And I meant to say this, John, he did one thing that Indiana fans would have been very, very happy to hear. And if you can get it and pull it up, but make the tournament at, well, after the game, well, that's all Kentucky's done is make the tournament. They haven't won. A, <laughs> they've won one game since 2019. Um, 
But he did say, maybe I'm going to have to, am I going to have to change how I do things? He did, yes. He acknowledged he that. The same thing last year, and he changed things this year. But you know what? They went to hey, a, a high-flying offense, and no, now they're too damn young. Defense. They're too damn young. Casey, would That's you agree to that? Change, yes. Yeah. I, I agreed with everything he said after the game in terms of it's crazy that seasons are defined by one game NCAA tournaments. I disagreed heavily that his team was built for this. Um, uh, I think you're touching on teams that don't play defense generally do not thrive in March. Um, I, I, I mean, it's not like Kentucky season was like crazy. Awesome. There were these upsets kind of built in throughout and every time it was a defensive issue. Yeah, so yeah, he added an offensive coordinator. The offense took off. Um, you have that much NBA talent. It's going to be pretty easy to score the ball, but the way Oakland beat them was just by out executing and getting the matchups it wanted. Like not only did they have a guy go off for 10 threes, but I thought like inside um, Trey Townsend had his way with Kentucky big men over and over again. And their only real option was to try and double and give up a easy pass to the free throw line to another big. So there definitely needs to be changes. Um, th there's no reason you can't strike a balance between getting NBA talent and guys that have been there that know how to play defense that are buying in. Um, it's just harder because like you need to find that balance because you can't be this young. I, I especially think that hurts right now while we're in COVID years and everyone has all these fifth year, six year guys. Um, so that separation of talent is kind of overtaken even more by experience, but there's no excuse that Kentucky doesn't have three or four guys they can count on that's already been there. Um, but it also sounds a little bit like Calipari doesn't really believe that he's like, well, I've done great things for all these young guys and got them into the league. And I, I think if there's anything that points to your point that he's going to be gone, I think there are plenty of schools that would be happy with that for a few years and would welcome that philosophy. Just get a bunch of talent in here. We'll be fine. But Kentucky, obviously, very high standards. And this has been a Purdue-like March run for Kentucky. Yeah. Um, well, not just a Purdue um, – um, March worse than the, the, the since 2019, they've won once. Right. Um, and not only that, I go back and I talk about, all right, they had a stretch of what, 10 years, 11 years where they had the number one recruiting class in the country, a decade, a decade of that. You win one national title. Come on, man. Hell UConn is about to go back to back. They just lost three starters off of last year's team. And they got three more that are going to go to the NBA this year because they reloaded. UConn's a, an enigma, man. But um, yeah, but Calipari is not going to let go of the range. He's going to go out on his terms. I promise you. I I, I do not see anything. This is like the the Woodson thing, man. They're not going to get pushed out like that. They're gonna they're gonna try to just try to get it to a deal where. Yeah, I'm I'm walking out because it's my decision. Um, but yeah, we'll see. But Purdue comes up today. They open up play. Uh, I forgot who they play tonight. You forgot? Who, oh, who Purdue plays? Yeah, Grambling State. Oh yes. So that should be a. Uh, I'm glad. I'm glad that's not a 9:30 game. Is all I'm saying. Well, maybe it should have been. I. But I'll I'll be there, so I'm glad it's not. Uh, I mean, there was Indianapolis. Purdue is always going to be the prime time game. I feel like. Um, now, all right, this brings up a discussion. Mm -hmm. During the Big Ten tournament, I had Purdue was they played early. Indiana played last. Indiana draws TV ratings just be, mainly, partly because they have the uh, a large alumni, second largest alumni base in the country. So they naturally will get more eyes, but uh, Purdue played first. And I, and I, I'm not meaning this as a slight, so don't take it that way, but 
the this the amount of eyeballs Purdue Purdue has 177,000 Twitter followers, whereas Indiana has 1.1 million. Uh, and it's just I, I was wondering about the scheduling of the Big Ten tournament if it was because of that. Um, no, but yeah, it's always you, been that. It's you, always you been that. The, the early games are always the high seeds because you want to give them as much rest as possible. Because well, then you know, Sunday's going but, early. But that doesn't. That, that's the opposite of what's happening here. They're playing to the second, the last game of the day. Well, but this isn't a back-to-back really to back tournament. Yeah, all oh, that's real. That's yeah. You and they'll play that. late again on Sunday. The difference is in the Big Ten tournament, it's back-to-back days. And eventually the championship game is going to be early because it's got to be in before the conference tournament. So you're not going to have your one seed play evening Saturday and have to come back in less than 14 hours. Agree. Anything about this team that even remotely, remotely gives Purdue fans pause, not Purdue about their opponent. About grambling in specific. No. Yeah. Uh, It's, it is lazy journalism and sports like comparison to say Grambling is anything like Fairley Dickinson. Um, first of all, Fairley Dickinson last year was one of the like smallest teams in the entire country, uh, like tiny, tiny, and they were honestly one of the worst defenses uh, last year. So what they did against Purdue was even more shocking. But I think I think Grambling's a good team. I think they know how to win. I think they are battle tested. I think, but I think like all the concern, they're still a 16 seed. They've still been blown out by every uh, big program they've played. The concern all lies with Purdue and handling it. And I think Purdue's done a good job this year of showing that, you know, they are a different team that they've responded to everything. But like it is March, Purdue has lost what is it three straight to double seeds three or four straight so like it it would be ignorant to say there's nothing to worry about because there was nothing to worry about last year and obviously fairly dickinson went the way it went i know better than that than to do that but there's just nothing about this team that i see that should cause any worry uh, for Purdue, I think Purdue could sleepwalk through this game um, and be okay. But yeah, well, that's I, why they play the games. I don't think Purdue can sleepwalk. I think they feel and they need to make a statement. Um, well, I agree with that. They don't need to. I'm just right. saying I think that they could in this game because this there's just nothing about this team that uh, in Grambling State that just I'm like oh man. Uh, there's just they're just overmatched, uh, but never they have the same never. exact steal rate as uh, Fairley Dickinson last year. Well, I, I, and it's going to be dependent upon, like and again, like last year, the guard play of uh, Fletcher Lawyer and Braden Smith. Braden, uh, what he had like seven turnovers in the loss last year, so it's just he is. He's coming into this one, it seems, more comfortable, but mm-hmm. you don't know what's in someone's mind. Uh, right. He may be he may be comfortable, but things can change or whatever. It's how you get on the court when the game's going, how it is, or is everybody going to show up? Uh, first of all, how the hell was Southern Illinois not really good last year? They had Damask and, 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 and Lance Jones on that squad. Yeah, they had a lot of different shots last year. Um, Lance Jones was uh, – most of his threes were late in the shot clock and from very long range. Um, but, no, that's a, that's a lot of – it's a lot of high-end talent. Um, yeah, it's – I've asked Lance that a couple times. Um, obviously, you're not going to get a satisfactory answer from a player uh, in that regard, but – it was definitely a talented group, but uh, shooting, shooting is the thing that uh, stands to me as the big difference between this year's team and last year's, even if like, I know guard play is important, but like they were five of 26 from three last year. And this year's team has just been better than that. Pretty much every game all season. 
the the great thing about the NCAA tournament, it is the great equalizer, and you have to do it six times uh, against mm-hmm. six probably different teams, six different styles. That's what makes it so great. Uh, the Kansas game, damn near upset. I was hoping, really hoping. But the talk was how much pressure Sanford was going to bring. And I'm like, okay, wait a minute. How can Sanford, who is what they are, be looked at potentially being able to really beat Kansas? And if and if so, why aren't they better well, the record better than it was? Um, but that's exactly what happened. Man, they threw that net on Kansas at the end, especially, and just made that. And they got screwed at the end. There was the breakaway layup by Mm -hmm. Kansas that was a clean block. Clean block. And he get called for the foul. He hits two free throws. They would have had the ball and uh, a shot to win just down one point. Yeah, I mean, Sanford was 29 and 6. They won a lot. Um, only had three, yeah, three conference losses. Um, pretty much ran their tournament. I, I mean, you could say they made 10 more three pointers in Kansas and they miss, you know, they only go 13 or 23 from the free throw line. So, like, they, they kind of did some damage to themselves on the free throw line, but that's a tough team. That's a team produced all to start the season. Um, that's another one where they just play a particular style. Like they come at Kansas. And if, if Kansas is weak anywhere, it's, it's ball handling and like just their lack of depth. And yeah, they've got, how many turnovers did it end up being? Yeah. 18 turnovers for Kansas compared to just seven. Oh yeah. Yeah. That I, uh, that which was which was huge, but it was a fun game, uh, mm. which is what we want, uh, what we need to to see. Uh, today coming up, Purdue plays at seven twenty five this evening in Indianapolis. Also today, uh, I, I think it's the the first opening game around two ish. Western Kentucky plays. I forget who they play. Who do they play? Western Kentucky gets Marquette. Oh, yeah. That's, I don't know, that should be an interesting game. You've got Brandon Newman, former Purdue player, and Christian Lander, uh, former uh, Hoosier on, on the Western Kentucky team. So that there's uh, some intrigue for you there. The Florida Gators up in Indy as well. So, man, that, I've never seen, I, I, I'm amazed that they have a one and a two seed in this little bracket. And that all and three number one seeds are playing today, not just two. It's not it wasn't split up. Yeah. Um. Yeah, I don't have a good answer for that. Except, I mean, obviously Houston's in the West, but I guess it, build as much drama for the first day. The less the less amount of one seeds, the more chance for an upset in theory. Oh, Brian says McNeese State is killing him. Don't don't worry. It, it it's killing me because I had them. Oh, dang it. I had them winning like I don't know, three games, I think. Yeah, they're beating and Purdue. I, uh I'll go back and look. I don't know if it was McNeese or State Jeff or Purdue losing before the Sweet 16. No, 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 no. Uh <laughs> but I but I did have Kentucky in my final four. Uh, once again, uh, that's kind of on you. That's that's a terrible defensive team, man. You just that's go a lot to the, believe in. You, it, it, you just have to take a shot. I can't go chalk. I refuse to go chalk. I won't do it. Um, but You're, you you want credit for not going to chalk by taking Kentucky? <laughs> hey, man. <laughs> uh, you know you got a small do major Kentucky team. Hey. Who was going to – who picked Oakland, really? But um, I definitely got, contemplated it. You got to be different. You just got to be different. Uh, uh, what do you expect to be a lot of – Purdue game? 
Yes, sir. I I think Purdue tells themselves that they want to be up 15 by the five, like five minutes into the game, and they want a 30-point lead going into half. <laughs> I, 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 and I'm not even joking. Like, I think it, it, you want Zach's, this Purdue fans want this game put away in the first half. Correct. Uh, but I think these players do too. Um, Zach told me something interesting talking to him yesterday. And he's like, I think this is like all they wanted. And he told me like, they've waited a year for it and they think it's time to start forgiving themselves for what happened last year. And I, I think that starts by, proving to themselves, cutting into the narrative, and just jumping on Grambling from the start. They they don't want at any point for there to be, you know, a, a ESPN breaker going in, going, Purdue, number one seed after losing last year, down two with 12 minutes to play in the first half. Like, I, I don't think – I think there is enough just gumption by this team and just – They've been preparing for this single game all year. We've talked about it all year. All they've heard about is last year's game. And I think they are going to want to jump. I, I think Grambling, great coach. Um, he's won everywhere he's been. Great guys. The, the team's a lot of fun. I think they got put in front of a literal train. Absolutely. Well, looking forward to it. I'll be looking forward to seeing you up in Indy at uh, Gamebridge Fieldhouse. Plenty of games. Are you going to be there for the uh, early game, Western Kentucky? Um, honestly, probably. Cause like Marquette likes to play fast, and Western Kentucky is the number one team in pace. That game might be one thirty to one ten. Uh, could you imagine if this was an Alabama in there? Oof. I, I got to see that madness up in Toronto when Purdue played them. Um, it Alabama's a team where I, I'm going to say this now for everyone. I hope you did not take them very long on your bracket because those big no. guys are garbage. I have They're a like losing a Charleston star. today. Okay. Um, I like I that. Don't, I don't know that I had them losing today, but I think I had them losing uh, two days from now because they're like a shooting star to me. They're just boom. They're gonna flame out fast. They they're half a team. They, they're like they score a lot of points, but they allow more. That's the problem. That that's not a good. That's not a working formula. Casey yeah. Bartley from Boiler Upload. Make sure if you're a Purdue fan, you're giving him a follow. And if you're not, you can still go there to keep up on what's going on all over the place. Appreciate you, brother. And I'll see you soon up in Indy. All right. Thank you. Take care, guys. You betcha. Uh, We've got lots more coming up. Zach Osterman's on the program and Bob Kravitz as well. Brought to you by our good friends at the Chop Shop Market and Table, home of uh, Inside Indiana basketball and football coaches shows, as well as a great place to eat. You can sit down, have a wonderful dining experience. They have a complete salad bar that is going over like gangbusters. The best tenderloin in, in town, uh, without question. On the other side, you've got a market with a complete custom bakery and uh, deli with the quality, the most, the biggest selection of quality meats around. We're back with more Indiana Sports Beat Radio right after this. We'll be right back for more Indiana Sports Beat Radio with Jim Coyle, presented by Andy Morhonda of Bloomington. If you're looking for a home. I'm reading the comments. I feel like I'm yelling. <sighs> oh my God. <sighs> Man, this thing went from my head. 
down to my chest, but it's still in my head, and I still get that. Oh, yeah. See that Remax balloon? What about it? That's what's in the left side of my head for the last three days. Ugh. It won't pop. It still not popped. God, what if Purdue did lose, though? I know they shouldn't, but I said that yesterday about Kentucky. What if they do lose? If Purdue lost. The same conversation we'll be having, maybe not as extreme. Well, no, it won't be as extreme just because they don't have the fan base. But you know what it would be like? What? You'll get this reference. Uh, between Bloomington and Louisville would be the epicenter because you'd have Lexington out to uh, just out from East. Louisville and and yeah. Purdue just up from Bloomington. It would be like that sinkhole that happened in at, at uh, the Corvette plant in Bowling oh, yeah. Green several <laughs> years ago, where the ground just opened up and so, some of the yeah. classic Corvettes went down. If Purdue were to lose, that's what it would be like. It would be like a sinkhole was opened up and all four programs have fallen in because you just <laughs> had Kenny Payne get fired. Kentucky go, wants seconds. Calipari fair and get more to your door. This segment is brought to you by Remax advanced realty Indy home pros team by Cheryl Sizemore. Welcome back to Indiana sports beat radio with Jim Coy presented by Andy Moore Honda of Bloomington. Welcome back, Indiana Sports Beat Radio here on this second day of the NCAA tournament. Ready to get at it. A lot of uh, storylines today. Jalen Blackman and Stetson uh, get to hit the stage as they are a 16 seed. Guess who they get to play, John Boy? UConn. That's right. They got the Huskies. It is going to be interesting to see um, what Jalen Blackman can do. Yeah, I'm sure if anyone in the right mind on the Indiana staff would be paying attention to Jalen Blackman today. I mean, I know they already know he's a great player based on what he's already shown prior to today, but this will be a good little barometer test, if you will. Barometer, I like that. Uh, but so, you know, he's he, he's a blackman. He, he's knocking down shots. How about this stat? This is very cool. Uh, let me go back to that. Um, he finished up as the twentieth all-time scorer in the in Indiana basketball history. He broke his dad's record, and he became the third blackman. Among the top 150 scores in Indiana high school boys basketball history, his older brother James Blackman Jr., a McDonald's All American, of course, went to Indiana, is 15th with uh, nearly 2,400 points. His dad, James Blackman Sr., at uh, right under 1,900 points, who played at Kentucky. And now you've got Jalen, who was just looked at as being too small. It's it's the Sean East syndrome. Sean East played with uh, Romeo Langford at New Albany, and everybody could say, "Well, why is he not getting any offers? He just wasn't big enough." But he's it's taken him four years, and everybody said, "Now look, see, Sean, yeah, yeah, but this is four or five years later." I mean, geez, guys, he he, but he he has worked his butt off to get where he is, and now Jalen Blackman. This is a kid. This is one of those guys that mm, I'm going to be shocked if somebody doesn't sweep him up. 
Oh, he'll Indiana. absolutely get swept up. And Indiana would and be Indiana wise better to be, be looking at offer. Him. Absolutely. Uh, and you know what? Uh, there's and every day we're hearing more names that Indiana's in contact with. But uh, again, to be honest with you, it's almost pointless to me right now that stuff because these are all, and I don't mean this is a slight, but lower level players. The best players are still playing for the most part. That could but be our, guys I there. do agree with you for the most part, but at the same time. I mean, Dalton Connect came from Northern Colorado, who only won 12 games last year, and now he's one of the best players in college basketball. So, Oh, there's, uh, the there's best, no doubt there's some out there. The best teams are still playing, obviously, but you may have a diamond in the rough. Again, it could be somebody like Jalen Blackman that has yet to be truly discovered because they're not playing on a big-name team yet. So any of these guys that Indiana has reached out to, like we, yesterday we talked about Frankie Fiddler. I know he loved that name literally for the name but he could be Fiddler somebody that ends up being someone next year if i mean i should have said that out yesterday Indiana. what frankie fiddler no fiddler in the hall oh yeah we if love he him. came to indiana he'd be fiddler in the hall i'm rooting for him to come simply because of, uh, the memes would be great i, I want fiddler oh, on the man. roof fiddler in the hall whatever I, I'm, I'm here for that kind of stuff i think it's hilarious uh, what i don't remember what position does he play is he a guard He's a guard. He's a good shooter, too. I mean, most of the guys that Indiana has reached out to, rightfully so, are Oh, shooters. yes. Very guard heavy. Well, again, I give – you don't hear me say this very often. Well, hell, you never hear me say this. <laughs> <clears throat> but I give Calipari a lot of credit for sitting there after that, that horrible loss, knowing he knows what the U.K. fan base is going to be like because they already are. They're already yeah. pissed off. And he knew what it was going to be like after that game. But I'll tell you, he did two things. He did not throw his players under the bus and then turn around and say, I'm not that kind of coach that throws his players under the bus, but I didn't miss shots and I didn't miss free throws and blah, 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 blah. And nor did he make excuses. He said that, Again, that maybe I'm going to have to change things. You know, he he recognized that the youth of his team. You know, he said that the average age of his team was like 19. He said, and you know, we we're getting beat by a you know team with an average age of 24, which is probably not quite true, but it might be. Um, but you would think it's only taken a. a dozen years for him to recognize this that yeah you can win a lot of games but when it comes nut cutting time man it it doesn't work because it's such a pressurized and uh, people ask why, why is it so different the pressure is different it is a different scenario you're not at home number one you are not at home so the uncomfortability is the same for everybody and that home court is a huge advantage, obviously. And then you add in the pressure of needing to win. Kentucky needed to win. They hadn't won since 2019. They Everybody can say that, you know, we're not thinking about that, but uh, bull, it, it, it's in, it gets in your head. But you can see what happens with young players in these situations. Not all the time, but happened to Purdue last year. That'll be the difference for this year. I mentioned Jalen uh, Blackman getting a go at it on the big stage today. Also, Christian Lander, I mentioned earlier, the former Indiana player from down in Evansville. And a uh, shout out to all of our peeps listening on 97.7 ESPN. The ref, always the right call in Evansville. And... 1380 The Fan, Fort Wayne's only sports station. How are you guys doing? Uh, and 1230 AM, 104.7 FM, WJOB, the voice of the region in Hammond and Chicago. Shout out to all our peeps there and everybody else listening on YouTube all over the place. We appreciate and love you guys. Speak of a matter of fact, for those of you that are not subscribed, please just hit the subscribe button now. Uh, you have no idea how much we simply appreciate that. It does not, 
do anything or you don't get uh, junk mail. We're not sending anything to you. We just appreciate it. It helps us. We appreciate it. But Christian Lander found his spot. And, you know, could he have worked out at Indiana had things been done differently? I don't know that. We'll never know that. But he was he was done wrong by Archie Miller. Lil Rody screwed him over by getting him to come out of high school early. He was not ready. But uh, we've got lots more coming up. Zach Osterman from Indy Star is going to join us. We'll talk about all of this and more. Brought to you by our Cheryl Sizemore. And Remax Realty in the Indianapolis area. If you're looking for a home, you need Cheryl and her two decades of experience. It could be the difference between getting the home you want or not. Reach out to her at Cheryl at IndyHomePros.com. We're back with more right after this. We'll be right back for more Indiana Sports Beat Radio with Jim Coyle, presented by Andy Moore Honda of Bloomington. In the market, for- you got water nearby? What? Do you have water nearby? I got coffee. Why? You know, that mean I guess that works too. Just your, your throat doesn't sound the best. Uh, that's just once I get on a full rampage, I guess it runs out. Um, does Jim have disdain for Woody? No, I don't have disdain for him. Absolutely not. I just don't think he's. You know what I think. I've said it over and over. No, there's no disdain. Anything I say is not personal. I, I Man, you have no idea how ADHD I am. And one of the bad qualities of that, there's some good qualities to it actually, but one of the bad qualities is the you're, uh, you can be very impulsive, which uh, includes saying things, thoughts, spoken words. You know, if it's a if it's a thought in here, it's usually out of the mouth before the thought is even finished. Um I have, my man, I love five laughs. He's 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 one of the one of the peeps I'd love to sit down and and uh have one with. He thinks that I I don't have any disdain. It's not that, but I do think that he is not the coach. I do think that he's not come close to getting the job done, but worse, I don't think he understands what it takes to actually be a successful college coach because he refuses. That's why I just said, man, you're never going to hear me compliment John or Calipari, but I did because he did something that is the complete opposite of what we've seen all year. College basketball. Does I gotta not say though, Jim, that's one press conference. Like he usually has been. I'm just, but I'm football. just pointing it out because every press conference we saw the otherwise was not that. It was the opposite. And more importantly, college basketball does not run through the middle, as he doubled down by saying, "It does not." How 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 did it how did that work out for Kentucky with uh or more so for uh, Oakland? Did they run their offense through the middle? Nope. How, how many teams, how many upsets that happened yesterday were by teams running the ball through the middle? No. That's Here the thing. Go. 15 I, I haven't heard from Zach, so hopefully, hopefully he comes on. Here we go. For additional information, 812-583-0919 or go to MyStoneCrestLiving.com. That's MyStoneCrestLiving.com for more details. This segment is brought to you by The Ugly Grouper. Welcome back to Indiana Sports Beat Radio with Jim Coyle, presented by Andy Morhonda of Bloomington. Welcome back. It is Friday of the opening week of NCAA play men's tournament. Women's starts. Well, I guess it starts. It starts today. Maybe I know Indiana women play tomorrow. Uh, I don't remember if that's a first game, round game or not. Um, 
I'll ask Zach. When Zach Osterman from the Indy Star joins us now. Zach, I know Indiana women play tomorrow, but does the women's tournament start today or is tomorrow the first day? I think it starts today, doesn't it? I, I think you're right. Absolutely. Uh, but, yeah, the Indiana women play tomorrow. Up in Indianapolis, you've got Purdue playing. You've got Western Kentucky with those storylines. Uh, Indiana spring football. Were you able to get out there, Zach? Uh, no, unfortunately, the, the the brief open period is when I'm putting my kid on the bus. So yeah, it's uh, I'm doing something called a radio show every every day during that. I'm like, damn, um, couldn't make that happen either. But um, I was looking forward to trying to get out there to see uh, how that went. Uh, opening day, uh, from what you've seen and heard, what are your uh, thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's obviously really early to to know anything. I mean, Indiana's not even put pads on yet. They won't, I assume, until next week. You have to have two unpadded practices to start, and I think their next practice is going to be uh, tomorrow on Saturday. Um, you know, I mean, it, it it there's so much new that I think there's an extent to which it, it's probably even going to be dangerous to draw conclusions from, like, the spring game, you know, because there's going to be – moving pieces. We've already seen a couple players enter the transfer portal. I think that will kind of continue. Um, I expect Indiana to be active in the portal after the spring. Um, you yeah, know, somebody entered the portal yesterday, right? Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I just think that um, there's going to be so many moving pieces to all this, particularly from the perspective of a program that as a new coach, two new coordinators, a whole bunch of new faces, probably some some guys that are likely to be starters in, in, you know, big, important roles that weren't with the program last year. It's, I think it's just – it is a little bit of a kind of a, you know, patience and just kind of wait and see what what comes down the, the pike, so to speak. Patience is a virtue without question. Uh, newsflash, Federico Federico is in the portal from Pittsburgh – I just wanted to say that name. Um, some great games yesterday, Zach. The NCAA tournament brings us what uh, we look for, of course, upsets, uh, crazy comebacks as Nevada coughs up a 17-point lead with seven minutes to go. Kentucky losing to a team who who has a guy that comes off the bench and, and chucks up 23-pointers and was just amazing. Kansas almost – well, they got lucky. Uh, there were some good games. The The tournament slate, is, the brackets already altered. And now today we've got day two of this. Yeah, I mean, it, you know, these are kind of the two most fun days of the year. I, I, I still stand by my assessment that the Friday, Saturday, Sunday of major conference tournament weekend is, is you know, tends to produce a larger quantity of fun basketball. Um but, you know, I mean, the, the fun here is, you know, just how many games you have going on at the same time, you know, clashes of styles. Obviously, yeah, you get some fun upsets like Duquesne and, and Oakland yesterday. Those are always easy for, for people to kind of get behind. But you also get, you know, I mean, like um, I enjoyed watching Illinois Moorhead State, you know, and obviously Illinois winds up pulling away with that. But it was a good game for a while. I enjoyed watching. Um, I'm just looking at my bracket here. Uh, I, I didn't make it through the whole game, but I enjoyed watching Kansas Sanford. I thought Sanford would give Kansas a a good game there, um, and they wound up giving them a great game. Maybe even you know I, I saw that I saw it in the morning, but I saw that call that went against Sanford late that felt a little bit harsh, maybe more like a block than a foul. Um, this is just, I mean, this is this is such a fun time of year, and it's. You know, in many ways, it's it's kind of the conclusion of this run that we have from October to March of, you know, kind of everything going on at once, if you understand what I'm saying. of um, You know, if you obviously you got college football, you got college basketball, you got the NFL and then college, you know, uh, college basketball gets fired up during the NFL season. And. You know, obviously, if, if you are like me, you are of a certain soccer persuasion, and that's going on as well. But, you know, once the NCAA tournament ends, it is kind of like, okay, now, you know, in terms of American sports, we kind of turn our attention, major American sports, we turn our attention to the um, 
the NBA playoffs and opening day for baseball and, and, you know, things kind of settle into a bit more of a spring and summer rhythm. So, uh, yeah, it's just, I mean, it's a fun time of year. Uh, plenty of people will be hitting the portal. Of course, it's already started, but uh, obviously that still has a lot of names yet to come as so many teams are still playing in this tournament. Uh, in Indiana, we've seen so many different names that Indiana has reached out to. Nothing uh, tangible yet, nothing uh, with with teeth, just a lot of different guys. Uh, Leland, uh, tag on, Leland Taylor, is that his name? Leland Walker, is that your thing? Leland about? Walker, rather. Uh, yeah, uh, an Indianapolis product. Uh, Stetson's Jalen Blackman. He, they're still playing, but there's no doubt that he's going to be a wanted guy probably. Yeah. I mean, what I, what I've sort of, what I say about the portal here is um, this is a time when, you know, th this week in particular, there is just a lot of uh, white noise. You know, there's, there's a lot of players going into the portal. There's just a, a, a really large number of kind of um, just a large quantity, essentially, of, you know, players going in, opening their recruitments, you know, whatever they're trying to do. Um, and obviously, as the, as the first weekend in particular of the tournament, you know, kind of unfolds, you'll get a lot, particularly of maybe mid and low major guys that, um, that start getting that, that, that once their season's over, they enter the portal as well. And there will be a lot of discussion of, you know, this team is interested in this player. This team has contacted this player. You'll see guys, you know, that will come out with um, just, just, you know, huge lists um, of, of, you know, 12, 15 teams that have all been in touch. And when I say a lot of it is white noise, what I mean is just that basically, you know, you, you, you've got to give this, this whole thing some time to sort of settle, essentially. And, you know, I think it, it, it still moves fast. But I think that with some exceptions – that first week, there's there's always a handful of guys that have a pretty good idea of what they want and where they want to go, whatever. Um, but with some exceptions, it's kind of that second week when guys really start digging into this is where I want to visit. You know, these are the people I'm interested in hearing more from, etc. Um, so I just think that I think that probably where where we are at right now is is a little bit still kind of in that you know, that, that white noise stage of just like so many players going into the portal. And again, you know, it's, it's kind of, I mean, listen, it's, it's simplistic to say this, but after this weekend, there will be 16 teams left playing, which means that there will be 346 teams or 340. Yeah. 346 teams that whose players will feel free to enter the portal. It's after this weekend that I think stuff will really kind of pick up and change. And and you'll start to really see like tangible movement kind of across the board. And obviously, we know that uh, Indiana has to really fill some guard spots. But I'm expecting there to be seven spots to fill. I, I do not expect Kalel Ware to be back. Now, that's that's not that doesn't mean that he won't be. Obviously, but I'm just from looking at the boards, and I, I just think that he's going to be a first round pick. And if you're a first round pick, I don't see him turning that down personally. We'll see. But regardless, if it's six or seven, that's still a, a sizable number for a staff who has been so so. They've gotten some home runs, but they've also you know struck out. Um, this is obviously is the most important offseason for Mike Woodson in his short tenure, but he has to get it right right now. They have to fill these roles, these positions, with guys that can do what Indiana was not able to do this year. What do you, with what we've seen previously, how likely are they to really to, to get all of those pieces 
when guys guys watch other teams and Indiana running the ball through the middle and then with Woodson doubling down and saying that I believe college basketball runs through the middle still. I don't I don't know how that affects guys that are shooters, uh, guards, and et cetera. Yeah, I mean, I guess to your first point about where, I, I mean, um, I would be surprised. And, you know, there's – there's a range of, of opinions on him between I've seen guys that have him in the lottery. I've seen guys that have him in the second round or I should say draft projections. Um, but I think enough people see him as a top 20 prospect, top 20 type pick that it's just hard for me to imagine it, it being worth it for him to come back. Um, you know, rather than just going ahead, getting on that rookie, getting on that rookie deal, it's fully guaranteed, start moving towards your second contract, et cetera. Um, it has been interesting to me. It seems like if you kind of look at, and I, you know, it's, it's not a, an, an extraordinarily long list of names yet. It does seem like Indiana has been in touch with more guards in the portal early on here. And I don't know that that's a, you know, I don't think Indiana is going to play four out one in next year, but it does seem like there's maybe a bit more of an emphasis on guard depth. And, and guard play, and, you know, we can – you mentioned Leland Walker, who's in the portal. I think there's – you know, there's certainly a feeling around college basketball that Jalen Blackman will go in the portal when Stetson's season ends, presumably today, because they play UConn in a 116 game. Um, you know, it, it – those are, I think, two players that, yeah, it's possible Indiana could target. It's possible others could too. What I would say is um, – Per my understanding, Indiana has really doubled down on its its NIL opportunities, you know, and, and I think that the amount of money that we're talking about Indiana having, I don't want to say it's necessarily twice as much as it was a year ago, but I think we're talking about substantially more money than even a year ago in Indiana probably had one of the most robust setups in the Big Ten. So, um, you know, I, I wouldn't be shocked if Indiana had a top 10 or even a top five number nationally right now in, in, in total NIL resources. And that's going to make, you know, that that's that's going to be a big part of your your pitch. I mean, that's, you know, you can love it, you can hate it. That's just kind of the way, you know, recruiting works now is, is you know, these kids want to know about their opportunities in, in the NIL space and, you know, they want to be able to capitalize on their likeness. And if Indiana's going to have really competitive numbers in that area, then Indiana's going to appeal, I think, to a lot of these these transfers. But in general, um, you know, I think it, it, we could sit here and speculate all day on who's going in and, and, you know, who Indiana might target or whatever. I just think, I think Indiana is, you know, is, has got to, as you say, they've got a lot of work to do and they've just got to be expedient about who they're pulling in. Absolutely. And I know Indiana fans are keeping an eye on that. Um, and it's, it's ironic uh, I said in the break earlier before you joined us, I said, man, if Purdue were to lose today, there would be between Bloomington and Louisville in the dead center of that would be the epicenter of uh, this Purdue, Indiana, Louisville, Kentucky. It would be like the, uh, the, the sinkhole that happened at the, Corvette Museum in Bowling Green, Kentucky, several years ago, that just suddenly opened up and bam, because these four programs, while Purdue is having a good run, not so much in March yet, um, just ironic that all four of those programs, well, Purdue's been winning and Kentucky's been winning, but the, it's the March success. The ones that haven't been winning, obviously no March success, but even the ones that have been winning like Kentucky and Purdue, Indiana has as many wins since 2021 is Purdue, Kentucky, and Louisville combined, which is a crazy stat. Um, you mean you mean in the tournament? Yes, 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 yeah. yes. Yeah. No, it's, it's. I mean, it's. It has not been a. I mean, Purdue, to be fair, has held up its end. I understand they they lost the 116 game last year, but you you know you you don't win two you don't win back to back outright Big Ten titles by accident. I mean, like the let's be let's be fair. Purdue still is what. 
<clears throat> what it has been sort of billed as these last several last couple of years, one of the best programs in the country, the, the Fairleigh Dickinson loss notwithstanding. But this this little axis, if you even kind of want to hook in Cincinnati, which obviously had some kind of down years, uh, that it seems like West Miller's maybe pulling them back up a little bit, but it's not like Cincinnati and and I mean, even maybe to some extent Xavier have you know pulled up a ton of trees. Um, you know, Xavier had a nice bounce back year in Sean Miller's first year last year, but they didn't make the tournament this year. Again, Cincinnati is still trying to build back with Wes Miller. Louisville, obviously, is just a mess. You know, you talk about Kentucky. The results really have not been there. There's been a lot of questions about just kind of like, you know, basically, does does John Galbar still have both hands on the wheel? Um, I know that, you know, that this felt a little bit maybe reactionary, but I, I know there were people who wondered last night if, if that was Calipari's last game at Kentucky. And then you have Indiana. Obviously, and even Butler, you know, to some extent, a, a program that you know really I think has has struggled to find its competitive footing in the Big East in the last four or five years. The point is, this this part of the world, this kind of Indiana, Kentucky, Ohio, you know, triangle here, cares a lot about college basketball and hasn't necessarily seen a ton of success in it in the last few years. No, and uh, the transfer portal and NIL has added to that um, because it it has given so many other programs the opportunity. But then when you see a team like Oakland do what they did, they don't have any of that stuff. Um, you know, Nevada and uh, – uh, well, Dayton apparently is supposed to have a decent NIL, but um, – Dayton is a really good program for its level. I would argue it's the best program in, in that – conference and i would actually argue and um, history they've got tradition as well you know, I, I think i mean there's no such thing as a a foolproof job but if you if you look at dayton just historically you know you've got i mean go back to i'm looking as far back as 97 you got oliver purnell who was consistently posting winning conference records and went to two ncw tournaments there wound up going to Clemson and it just did not work at all. Um, you've got Brian Gregory who went to two NCAA tournaments there. You know, I mean, probably was, and this is just the Ken Palm era, probably the worst of the coaches they've had and still had one, two, three, four, five, um, 20 win seasons in eight years. Then of course you had Archie Miller who has never been able to replicate the success that he had at Dayton, you know, the, those, those four straight tournament appearances. And then Anthony Grant, and I'm not picking on Anthony Grant, you know, by any means, but Anthony Grant's, you know, a, a guy who's already kind of ridden the, you know, hot young assistant, mid-major success, high major didn't work out at Alabama kind of track record. Now he's back at Dayton and they're kind of, you know, they're, they're sort of sweeping all before them. This is, um, this is technically his first tournament appearance. They would have been a one seed the year they canceled the tournament. Again, if you look at just his success in that conference, the only year that he did not post a winning record in a 10 play was his first season. They went eight and 10 since then 13 and five, 18 and 09 and seven, 14 and four, 12 and six, 14 and four. Um, I, I would argue that is actually in a weird way, you know, as foolproof of a job as kind of there is, and they have the money you talk about for that level. They have the tradition you talk about for that level. They have, a real sort of buy-in from their fan base, you know, in Dayton, there's, there's Dayton basketball and then there's kind of everything else. Um, that is a, that is a program that is, you know, it, it, it's one of those where sometimes, and I'm, I hope I'm not being overly harsh, but you know, you, you look at again, Ollie Purnell, you know, never really clicked at Clemson or DePaul, Brian Gregory, never made an NCAA tournament at Georgia tech. Archie Miller never made an NCAA tournament at Indiana. It's one of those programs where almost there's an extent to which, you know, if you're going to hire from it, you better be sure because, you know, it's it's kind of been a place where everybody's had success and then they've not been able to replicate it when they've moved on. And actually what I've heard is Anthony Grant is kind of digging in there. If I'm not mistaken, he's a Dayton alum. And I think there's an extent to which he sort of feels like, hey, I did the high major thing. It didn't work out. Now I've got a good thing going to Dayton. I'm just going to stay here. Um, last question. 
Indiana has is likely going to have seven spots to fill, Zach. How much of that do you think is going to come from the portal? And with zero 2024 20, recruits, will they even land a 24 or try to land a 24 recruit? I mean, I think you always explore your options. There's coaching changes. Obviously, we've seen the staff have success in those, you know, sort of compressed recruitments in those, you know, those moments when maybe they they had to, you know, kind of recruit somebody really fast or in Malik Renew's case, kind of revive their interest very, you know, at a very late hour. Um, but it does seem like Indiana is going to be more portal focused. I think Indiana does seem very invested at this point in, um, you know, doing whatever it can to be at the front of the line for Braylon Mullins and Trent Sisley in 2025. But in, in 24, um, it, I think, you know, this team is probably going to be looking for more portal help than high school help. And, you know, speaking of that 25 class, it's a very, very good one. Jalen Harrelson, you mentioned uh, Trent Sisley and, uh, um, uh, Braylon, Ed, uh, Braylon uh, Mullins as well. Those guys, they're going to be watching what happens this season. And because there's going to, you know, how this season goes will impact that very much as well. Uh, Zach, what's up next for you, man? Uh, I'll be with Purdue all weekend. So just just trying to um, get back in the, the NCAA tournament swing. Well, I'll see you up in Indianapolis this evening, brother. Sounds good. Thanks for Thank you, me. Zach Osterman. Thank you, sir, from the Indy Star. Make sure you're giving him a follow. Keep up on uh, all of his content. We've got more coming up, including Bob Kravitz from bobkravitz.com. Uh, brought to you by the Ugly Grouper on Anna Maria Island, Florida. Man, for all of you that live down in Florida that listen on YouTube, I know that you're tons of you down there. You should go uh, to uh, the Ugly Grouper and have yourself a – and experience go watch some games let me know if you're anytime you're going let me know get you set up with some some stuff uh but it's great, great right on the island man i've never been there uh and i'm so dying to go but back with more indiana sports beat radio right after this we'll be right back for more indiana sports beat radio with jim coyle presented by andy more honda of bloomington formerly all right, this will be an open segment, shorter one, before we bring Kravitz on to end the show. And then right. I've got Signetti sound. Uh, Perfect. His, his, um, his opening statement's actually, it's kind of funny, and it's also good, I think. So I'm, that's what Perfect. I'm going Perfecto mundo. He talks about, uh, well, I won't spoil it, just because it, it is kind of funny. So, But it is. Spoiler alert! He says something in the first 10 or 15 seconds that made me chuckle a little bit, so. Chuckle, chuckle. Everybody needs a chuckle, chuckle. And I don't know what it is. And I know we, we've talked about this before, but the way that he just presents himself when he speaks, it is it is very Bob Knight-like, and it's almost scary how much it is. And I know he's not going to be – like he's not that caliber of a coach. At least I don't think he is. But um, it is it is funny, the similarities in the way that they speak. Yeah, I, I under, yeah. He's almost more Bob Knight would never say I win Google me. No, no. That's what that's one that's one thing. But I also feel I feel like am I, I know cut we you off really and tell you to go after yet. yourself first. <laughs> he's what? the kind of guy though who 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 will, who will clown a media member though if he wants to, I feel like. Oh gee. Yeah. Oh. He tried to clown me on the first damn day and others asked him about the NIL stuff. Yeah. And he did the same thing to a couple other guys, which I just thought I found that to be rude. I understand wanting to set a tone, but you come into your opening press conference and you're kind of dickish to, uh, you know, a couple of the media members. Cause well, who knows why, but, um, yeah, whatever. It's all good, man. It all good. Oh, the calendar is back. The gritty calendar is back. 
Oh yeah, the uh, the transfer calendar or what you know the the roster, whatever you want to call it. The gritty. I tell you what, Malik Renu shocked some people yesterday. I feel like announcing his return. No. Oh yes, and he, let me put this way: uh, he didn't shock me, but there was a good money, 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 money. He was money, money, you, money. You money. even you even mentioned the fact that he might not be with Indiana next year. Uh, yeah, you didn't but, talk about it as much as you do with Ware or maybe even in Baco, but you mentioned it. I well, because I think he thinks or hopes that he can still get to the NBA yeah. by continuing to grow and. He knows that. Ten seconds. Sorry, I didn't mean to give us a short amount of time. Ridge line. Go to AndyMoreHonda.com and get more to your door. This segment is brought to you by Bubba's 33 in Clarksville and Evansville. Pizza, burgers, beer. Welcome back to Indiana Sports Beat Radio with Jim Coyle, presented by Andy Moore Honda of Bloomington. Hey, hey, welcome back, everybody. Thanks a lot for being with us here on this Friday of the opening week of NCAA basketball play and looking forward to more games a day. Who's going to be the upset, John Boy? Uh, before we get into that. I'll give it to uh, you real quick. I'll just give you a short answer because I mentioned it earlier, and it's Charleston over Alabama. It's a, four, a 13 over a four. That's, that's my pick of the day for a big upset. I've also, Actually, you know what? One more. I, I, this is just for fun, but I hope it happens. Western Kentucky over Marquette. Oh, wow. Well, hey, um, it was Casey that said that could Western Kentucky is number one in pace. I did not know that, but that's an interesting. Well, I didn't either. Sure. I think that he, that's what he said, right? Yeah. So that's going to be, see, that's going to be an interesting game. I can't wait to uh, get up there to see that. Uh, looking forward to that. Kurt Signetti, Indiana's new football coach, met with the media yesterday as Indiana spring practice began. I was not able to get out there, unfortunately, because they practice while we're doing the show. Um, but here's what uh, Coach Sig had to say to the media. Now, look, you guys are going to want to know a lot, but I mean, it's one practice, no pads. Uh, you play football pads on. I always call it pajamas when we go out like this. Some people think it's safer that we go out two days like this. It's really not, but, you know, whatever. Just tell me the rules and I'll play by them. So I thought the flow was good today. Players tried to do the right thing. Uh, about an hour, 55-minute practice. And uh, there's not a whole lot to tell you uh, other than, uh, you know, we have practice again on Saturday morning. We'll get 13 in this spring. And. 22, 23 in fall camp. And, uh, you know, most important thing is we're ready to go and run out the tunnel for the opener. So we're trying to promote competition. Uh, I, I think the defense is going to be a little shorthanded throughout spring because they're missing some key guys uh, that have played really good football collegiately in the past and that we expect to help us offense. Really the only significant guy out is Kidwell at right guard. But you know, you're looking at Carpenter, who's a really good player. Cars played football. Snee's been a top backup. Jalen Walker is an excellent linebacker. There may be another guy or two on defense. So uh, they're a little thin over there. And, uh, you know, with Blitty leaving, which was unexpected, uh, but uh, he did what he did. And that's all I'm going to say about that. And we'll keep it to our guys. Uh, we'll leave it there. Go. It was going to, it's very plain ad, but yeah, that was a good little rundown of, of his thoughts. Playing in pajamas, baby. I like that. <laughs> Playing in pajamas. Uh, you know, the only thing would be better if he said, if he just had them. Hey, all right, everybody wear some, like, uh, you know, those, they're not sweats. They're the, the pants you wear, nighttime pants, whatever the hell they're called. Yeah, I don't know what they're called. Yeah, I don't know. I'll but, tell you what, uh, though, I'm looking forward to I feel like it may, it may not happen after every press conference, especially during the, the spring season, but during the season, Signetti's going to be somebody that gives us just a some sort of funny soundbite 
every more often than you almost like a mike leach in a sense you know what i mean he's not going to be talking about fat little girlfriends and that kind of he stuff he ain't going to be as good as mike leach let me tell you that's uh but i think that's it's going to be his own brand get again oh absolutely gonna, there's no yeah, question about and that i think I agree with indiana's you. not had a character like that in no. in their head coaching position before no no it's been pretty pretty mellow what? It's well, Indiana is very buttoned up. Yeah. Um, very now, Tom Allen up. was very buttoned up. Yeah. He's buttoned yeah. up. He he had he's very exuberant, but still yes. very buttoned up. Uh, and no, they haven't had that. And guess what? They have no reason to be cocky, but I'm not talking about Kirk Signetti, I'm just talking about the program. But guess what? Sometimes you have to think it to be it. You know, if 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 that's why you see cockiness. Sometimes you have to have that in your mind. You have to think you're better or think that you're at this level. And I'm not saying that they're not, or he's not, or anybody's not. I'm just talking in generalities. Um, but no, you, you have to have that complete feeling of confidence in what you're doing. If not, you're second guessing. And there is no question Kurt Signetti has complete confidence in what he's doing. He has complete confidence that he is going to win at Indiana and that he's going to do it in year one. And I'm going to be honest with you. I think that they at least make a bowl game. I've said it before. I'll say it again. I think that this team could possibly win seven or eight games. Now, is that pie in the sky? Maybe. But it's based on their schedule. First of, first of all, and so many coaching changes of teams that they're playing, in addition to the fact that there's been a, a, a substantial upgrade in coaching for Indiana. And another thing you got to remember, too. Across the board, not just head coach, but one thing all that, the way across the board. One thing that Signetti mentioned previously, and it wasn't in this presser, but it was a few months ago, is Indiana lost, I think it was four games last year, by less than a possession or by one possession. And he was, I don't remember his record, Signetti's record, but I believe he, he had maybe nearly an unbeaten record in one possession games last year or maybe throughout his entire career or something like six. that. It was last year. I think they were 6-0. and oh. um, and, and Indiana. And about, if, and, if you just and, take that metric. And, well, and Indiana was 0-5 in that season. Yeah, so if you just reverse that, Indiana wins – seven or eight games last year and i'm, I'm yeah i'm not but saying you have to that, look that happens at the teams by default in those games you got to look at yes. the teams over there in that games he's not playing michigan state he's not playing yeah michigan i'm, I'm not state. saying that that happens by default but it's one of those things where with the right coaching you can just find yourself on the right side of the of the result if you have the right pieces in place absolutely but indiana has had the right pieces on the field they didn't have all the right they had and they had virtually all the right pieces on the sidelines do i have to talk any further than caleb DeBoer at alabama kane womack at alabama nick sheridan now at alabama it blows uh, my mind that the top three staffers i on just that saw i just saw that uh kevin uh um oh my gosh why am i drawing a blank former defensive line coach in Indiana on that same staff, Kevin Peoples, is now at LSU. Just think of the guys that were on that staff and where they are now. And think of the talent that was on those teams. Michael Penix, uh, A.J. Barner. Just, they had, they had enough, but they didn't have, it was one, key ingredient but it was the biggest ingredient that was the raw in it was the in the wrong place that was like it's like it was like a puzzle that was a 150 piece puzzle but the center piece is in the wrong place that was indiana football over the last few years don't i don't mean that to crack on anybody but that that's exactly how it was Look at the players, look at the coaches, and uh, where they are now. But regardless break. of that, we've got to take a break. Up next, Bob Kravitz for Bob Kravitz. 
Bubba33.com. Suck everything to talk about with him coming up. Brought to you by Bubba's 33 in Clarksville. All of our Southern Indiana fans and, and everybody traveling. Just jump off uh, I-65 there in Clarksville at, uh, oh my gosh, I'm thinking, forgetting of the of the uh, road they're on. Oh my goodness. Anyway, it's the big road there right off I-65 where all the stores are. That got it. Uh, I'll, I'll remember it as soon as we go to break. But pizza, burgers, beer, tons of TVs, food made fresh every day. Great place to watch a game. Great environment. Back with more right after this. We'll be right back for more Indiana Sports Beat Radio with Jim Coyle, presented by Andy Morhonda of Bloomington. In the market. All right. Russell, Kentucky is not getting early. He saying, is not. Where's he saying that at? Uh, in the comments. He is not leaving UConn to go to Kentucky. Why? He is a Northeastern guy. He's from New Jersey, number one. Number two, he's about to win back-to-back national championships. Why? That's a program that's at the top. Why on God's green earth would he leave UConn to go to Kentucky? UConn, I know you say new blood, blue blood. I mean, UConn's a blue blood now. Can we just say it? I mean, they're in the upper echelon of college basketball. They are in the upper echelon. Um, I guess you could say they've entered into, yeah, blue blood territory. Uh, Morning, Mr. Kravitz. How are you, sir? Oh, man. My day just got so much better. You have no idea. Why? Oh, because I'm looking at your beautiful mug. You know, today is my birthday. What'd you buy me? Happy uh, birthday, sir. Thank you. Alms cards. Alms cards. Send, send them on, baby. Golf season starting. Hey, are you you you're going to be in Indy today? I assume, right? <clears throat> oh yeah, I'm going to be uh, at the all the games today. I'll be there, brother. I'll see you for the Western game. Oh, okay. Is that the first one? Yeah. Western and Marquette. You sound terrible. Uh, trust me. That's that's usually, I, I usually sound terrible. I just sound worse. You sound worse than usual, yeah. Happy birthday, Bob Kravitz. Well, thank you very much. I just thought I would throw that out there because I'm a desperate soul. <laughs> happy birthday. If I sang happy birthday right now, I would just be done if we didn't have copyright issues i would play the stevie wonder happy birthday song coming back from break but I'm not <laughs> oh, that would be awesome uh, I, don't, would, I don't look a day over dead i mean i, I what are you 30 38 39 yeah something like that 64 today oh man time happy. to see you retire <clears throat> Happy birthday, Bob. Happy birthday, Bob. Oh, you know right, what? I go, forgot guys. that people can uh, listen no to all this thing. <laughs> yeah, like, during the breaks. <laughs> I, I completely forgot. <laughs> Here we go, guys. <clears throat> is your butcher, baker, and fish house, no matter where you live. This segment is brought to you by Hoosier Hanks East. Welcome back to Indiana Sports Beat Radio with Jim Corden, presented by Andy Morhonda of Bloomington. Welcome back on this Friday. Tournament play begins again today. Uh, is this considered round two or is this still round one? This is round one, I believe. Okay. I, I, I can never tell with how they name stuff. Yeah. Uh, even though I know it's the same the uh, this to the other side of the bracket is all but they they they're so weird i know how, how they hey, by the way you sound like fred sanford remember fred sanford red fox uh, elizabeth i'm coming elizabeth. to see you baby i'm, I'm oh my god i got bob kravitz on here and he's driving me nuts <laughs> hey i loved hey i watched that show as a kid uh 
sadly to say. I thought he was hilarious. He was. Brady. He had, what was his uh, – uh, Lamont. Lamont. Lamont was his son. You big, you big dubby. I told you, boy. I told you, you big dubby. You're you're doing a pretty damn good job there with your uh, with your voice there. <laughs> well, I guess that's one uh, one positive of it, man. You've had all kinds of stuff coming out here lately, uh, content wise. Of course, uh, probably the I think this is the most recent the, in uh, what's bigger than Zach Eady. The mental hurdle Purdue needs to clear as it starts this NCAA tournament today uh, to get over that. I almost said it. Boy, uh, I didn't say it. Uh, the H word. Hurdle? Hump. Hump. <laughs> my humps. My lovely lady humps. Check it out. Um, Purdue, we saw Kentucky again go down yesterday. Right. A team – Kind of like Purdue was last year without Zach Eady. They didn't have the young, the young guards, the young yeah. players. They've got seven, seven guys, Bob, that are listed in the Five ESPN stars. draft for yeah. that does not count the forward players, but seven in the top 25. Well, I thought that Jay Wright made a really great point uh, at one of the post-game shows. He said that with the COVID year and the NIL, you know, keeping guys in college longer, um, the average age of, of the teams, especially the mid-major teams, you know, the smaller teams, it's quite a bit older than it used to be. Now you're dealing with, you know, that Golki kid is what, 24, 25? Maybe he's my age, 64. I don't know. He was a Division II transfer. Hillsdale College. And I just love it when some guy who's going to be, um, you know, uh, uh, going to be working as a tax accountant for these players goes out there and just sticks it to them. You know, by sent a, text out, a tweet out yesterday and said, Kentucky has seven NBA players and they're losing to a, a team who is soon going to be an enterprise desk clerk or something like that. Right. Uh, no, it, but, but it, it's, I think it's tougher now to, to compete at this level with a really, really young team of one and dones. And I thought Jay Wright made made a really good point there, and that's why I think it's it's important. Uh, you know, uh, Matt Painter talks all the time about getting old and staying old, and you really have to do that in today's NCAA basketball. I mean, these young teams we saw last year with Purdue with the two freshman guards, they were not prepared for the moment. And as a result, they they got they got uh, punked. Michael asking Bob, which is worse, Kentucky losing to a double digit seed for the third time in four years, or Purdue losing to double digit seeds three years in a row? My answer would be they're both bad, really bad. Kentucky's is worse because they have higher. They're blue blood. They've got the banners. And, yeah. but yet there's a certain way the Calipari has been going about it. That hasn't been working. It's the same with Purdue though. Matt Painter has a certain way that he has gone about this and there's been no tournament success for Purdue, but that has been a long history. They've not been, they haven't had a, they've had a three elite eights since 1980. Three. Right. Right. A um, couple of, couple no. of sweet 16s. It's about, I think, and this is just my, this is, this is my view on it. I think the fact that Purdue plays such a center centric game where everything begins and ends with the big fella in the middle hurts them. Uh, you know, I mean, for years they've had the great big guy. And I, I don't think in the NC, the NCAA tournament is all about guard play. Um, we've already already seen it here in the first day. So, you know, I, I think that uh, we're going to find out if you can go deep in the tournament 
and maybe even the final four, and maybe even win the whole damn thing with a team that is built around its center. So, I mean, that, 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 that's uh, going to be really interesting to me. That's a team that Mike Woodson would love inside out inside out, baby. Uh, Dan Lebetard said that uh, Zach E. What did he say? He he said he's a plague on basketball. Yes. He's unesthetically he's he's unesthetically pleasing or aesthetically unpleasing, whatever it is. Uh, I I understand what he's trying to say. I and totally I, get it, and I agree with him because <laughs> Zach Eady is is this he's he's a he's just a different thing. He's not he's unlike. If, if it's like one of those tests, which of these things are not the same? Zach Eady. Right. He's right. It's just totally, totally unique. Totally unique. And, you know, let's face it. We, we love watching got high flyers. We love watching, you know, guys with, with ankle breaking uh, crossovers. You know, we, we like, um, we like to see that, that rampant athleticism. And while I think Zach is a terrific athlete, he doesn't play. He plays kind of a stiff, un, unesthetically pleasing game. I mean, now he's great. He's the best player uh, in college basketball two years running. I disagree with you, although okay, I don't think better. he is the best. It's not that he – I don't think he's a great basketball player. He's just oh. a gigantic human. No, don't start with that. Dude, yeah. I, okay, if you give me his body, I am going to have the same success. If you give that body to a, a lot of people, they're going to be just as successful. But I, I if you give me Braden disagree. Smith's body, I'm not going to be as successful as Braden Smith. Well, not with that body. Hell no. But what I'm saying is, though, I, I wouldn't be as successful as Braden Smith right. as, as him. Right. But give me that size and that bulk. I was athletic enough. That I can take the ball, turn around, and dunk it. Uh, I can hip check guys. It's it's man, when you're that big, it's you're just not something that anybody else sees. Well, there are clearly built-in advantages to being seven four, three hundred pounds, but the idea that he's somehow less athletic or that anybody in a seven four, three hundred uh pound body could uh, do what Zach Eady has done, I think, is insane. You're insane, Jim Coyle. You're insane. I'm Andrew Bynum. Yeah, um, see, not everybody at, at that size can can uh, can play. Hey, I had that, and then immediately afterwards, you got that. I got five lefts who says Jim is correct, which he never agrees with me, and but I love him for that. And then you got Michael, uh, who says I'm on the opposite, but Michael's a Purdue fan, uh, who we love having on as well. Um, Brian says Purdue now has arguably the easiest path to the championship. I'll say they have the easiest path to the final four, maybe, but not to the right. championship. No, no, no. To, to the you're final have four. To play it's, the it's, good all, team. it's all in front of them. Well, let's see. Who's two? Uh, Tennessee? Tennessee does. They beat the crap out of uh, whoever they played last night. Yeah, uh, McNeese. I forget who they yes. played. Yes. No, it was St. Peter's. They beat St. Peter's. St. Peter's they crushed. That's right. By McNeese 30. Else. But, uh, no, they, they look, they, there's no excuse. There was no excuse two years ago. There was no excuse last year. There's no excuse this year. They got to get it done. And I think the difference is – that you know, last year they were 290th in the in the country in three point shooting percentage. This year they are second, and you know they're gonna surround Edie like a bus full of Lilliputians and try to you know get the ball out of his hands. Good luck with that. But when they do, they've got guys who can knock down shots. Last year, what were they six of 25 against FDU? in that opening round game in Columbus. So I just think the difference is going to be the fact that they, they can make shots from, from the perimeter. 
Yeah, it's, it's going to be uh, interesting to watch. Some great upsets yesterday, the Kentucky game. And I've been I've talked about this with several of the guests today, but uh, it's just ironic right now that this Bermuda Triangle of, of pedigree college basketball, Kentucky, Louisville, yeah. Indiana, and if Purdue doesn't do something in this tournament, you can include them even though they don't have – that kind of a pedigree, but still a solid program. But I, I've been using the uh, saying that if Purdue were to lose early, there would be, you know, do you remember the the uh, sinkhole that opened up at the Corvette Museum a few years back? No. no. There was this, the Corvette Museum in Bowling Green where they're made, a sinkhole opened up and like nine classic Corvettes go down into the sinkhole. Um, but if Purdue were to lose, that sinkhole would open somewhere between yeah. Bloomington and Louisville. Yeah, I, uh, I, I wonder, you know, if, if Purdue lose, somehow loses, and they're not, they're going to win by 35 points. But if Purdue somehow loses, what, what happens with Matt Painter? And to me, to me, he's not going anywhere, but I hear people talking about Calipari, you know, and I realize expectations are higher at a blue blood uh, like that, like, you know, like Kentucky. But, you know, it, it would be interesting, but I don't think we're going to reach that point. I think they're going to, they're going to, uh, going to rain terror, rain hell on the NCAA field all the way to the final four. Uh, what did I just see? Uh, I know we're getting close to running out of time, but somebody said something that I wanted to. Uh, oh, Dr. Drew. Uh, I disagree with this, but uh, he says if the fans and media tone down the negativity, uh, Indiana will be fine. Players don't want to come uh, if fans hate the program and the coach. It's a self-fulfilling prophecy at that point. Well, you know, you've got the same thing going on in Kentucky, man. Kentucky. Trust me. It's, it's a race to the bottom. It's a race go to, to the, the Yeah, go to their boards. They're blowing up. It's it's oh. it, they're blowing it up right now. It's that's just how it is. Oh, they players they, they want to are, put a for sale sign in Calipari's uh, front yard. Yep, thirty million. That that's 33. that's doable for Kentucky, but it's not going to happen this year. There's I, no I, way. I would doubt it. He, would doubt he it. goes out on his his terms. I think. Well, I you know I think what he needs to do is bring bring in a transfer or two or three. Uh, with a little bit of a little little bit of experience. Now I know they got Reeves, who's been there for a while, but you know they've got so many kids, and you got eighteen and nineteen year olds playing against Jack Golke, who's you know sixty four. I mean that that that's a hard that's a hard ask. So I don't know. I I think I think it's an easy fix for Cal if he could just bring in a little bit of experience. From moments like these. And I acknowledge that he actually gave him credit, which you don't hear me do. He 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 hinted at the fact that, you know, do I need to change how I'm doing things? Yeah. Which is a complete opposite of what you have seen from Mike Woodson all year. That's what is driving a lot of fans crazy. The ones that are that are Mike Woodson thinks he's doing a great job, not, but that's not a coach that's throwing the players under the bus and then says, I'm not a coach that those players under the bus. That's right. not a coach who makes a bunch of excuses and says he's going to play this style, but then continues to play this style. Yeah. So well, now whether he changes or not, John brought up earlier, he said he's going to do that too before, but we'll see. He's done. Yeah. He's been doing this for, for 15 well, years. Now. Mike, Mike's NBA teams were, spread you out three point shooting teams. So I I just think that Mike and I'm not making excuses for him but I just think this is the team that he built. This this, this is this is a roster construction issue. Uh, I don't think it's a coaching issue necessarily. I think when you've been a coach in the NBA for whatever 20 years, you know what you're doing in terms of Xs and Os. There was no other conceivable way that Indiana University could play basketball other than inside out because they don't have guards. They don't have anybody who can shoot the ball. They don't have anybody who can break you down off the dribble. So I, 
I think if he's able to bring in some guys who can do some things at the guard spot, I think I think you'll see him change the style of play that they employ. Sean, with a great question. I mean, I wish we had more time. What is the worst, sucking the entire season uh, and missing the tournament or being awesome and then flaming out early? Mm. Well, sucking the whole season is, is worse. I mean, yes, that's, you, a, that's a whole year. That's a whole year of depression. Yeah. And, and yeah, that, that makes, that's like, would you rather be uh four and four and 13 and, and miss the playoffs entirely in the NFL or go to the playoffs and get beat by 40. So, Oh, I'm stating the One obvious. Minute. Well, there you go. That's what I'm here for. Mr. Obvious. Hey, Five I, love reading, be I love reading the notes at the bottom of the screen. It's great fun. And I know that's why I pop them up there. Bob, uh, so you're going to be up in Indy as well uh, at the Cambridge Fieldhouse for NCAA tournament play day two of the first round. Northwestern plays FAU today, Bob, by the way, not in Indianapolis, but you've got Western Kentucky taking on a really good Marquette team. Yeah. Uh, Western Kentucky is number one in pace. Uh, West, you've got uh, Kristen Lander and Brandon Newman on that team. Right. Then we've got uh, Purdue playing later on this evening. Got to hurry. And Grambling. So we've got to get out of here. Make sure to go to bobkravitz.com and uh, follow Bob's content. Be a subscriber. He's got it all going on, baby. And I will see you up there, my friends. Sounds good, buddy. Thank you, sir. Big thanks to Zach Osterman uh, and Casey Bartley. From uh, Boiler Upload, most importantly, thanks to each and every one of you. Without you, we have no reason to be here, and we are sincerely grateful. I promise you that. John, the producer, for keeping us between the white lines. Man, going to have plenty of content from uh, the, all the action this weekend and coverage from the 70th anniversary of the Milan Miracle. Complete coverage of everything. Man, we're doing it all. Until the next time. I'm Jim Coyle. I will see you on the radio. Thanks for listening to Indiana Sports Beat Radio. Be sure to subscribe to our YouTube page for more clips and team coverage of Indiana basketball, football, and more. You can also find full episodes and tons of other content on thehoosier.com. We'll see you next time for another edition of Indiana Sports Beat.